Hi, it's Jerry Roberts back with another edition of Newsmakers The Play Gear. It is Friday, August 7th, and we are joined by Delaney Smith of the Santa Barbara Independent and Josh Molina, man of many talents who uh, writes uh, about politics and policy for Newshawk. Thank you both. So um, shortly after we met last week, we had a pretty amazing story actually, which was the uh, public health department uh, lost track of uh, 28 dead people um, in terms of compiling the uh, data for the uh, uh, coronavirus, um, which it was almost a 100% error, error, which is pretty good. So uh, Delaney, how does this happen? Well, this happens because around May, mid-May, um, we started relying on the state's um, system. It's called CalReady, and it basically compiles data for us. Um, it gets information from hospitals, compiles the data, and then sends it back to counties. So that way, counties don't have to individually count these things when they're coming out with their um, daily data. Um, but it was significantly off, and someone working in public health who had the actual De uh, death certificates were like, hey, seems like there's way more death certificates here than there are actually <laughs> on the CalReady system. And then it, it was discovered that in fact, there were 28 more death certificates. Um, and so now that the county is committed to um, only, only um, counting them by hand, counting every death certificate individually by hand and no longer relying on the CalReady system. This is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> Not to put too fine a point out, but you know, how can you undercount the deaths, which is the single most important thing here by 100%. Um, Josh, Bill uh, McFadden's column this morning, he, he was ranting about the, the, the county and all of their statistical stuff. And I, I know uh, John over there has done sort of a guide to stats. Uh, I mean, what's your take? I mean, do they, are they just, uh, thoroughly confused over there? Is this, uh, as we used to say, uh, is it conspiracy or incompetence? Well, I think like everything with the pandemic, there's a lot of confusion and people are figuring things out on the fly. I, It's been frustrating covering the county because they seem to have uh, information that is at times unclear, um, inconsistent, and uh, sometimes they just don't answer. And so it's hard to tell. I think that probably they don't have all the answers and they don't know how to say that. So they probably say what they can and uh, it changes all the time. So in this case, um, they didn't even offer a real clear explanation. It took a couple of reporters on the call to ask them, okay, explain it. How did this happen? Is there a human involved? Uh, paint a picture, walk me through. And, and it was sort of like an interrogation almost that by the end, we kind of got a little bit of a clear picture of what happened. But um, what Delaney just explained, like no one explained it that way from that table. That, that, that's interpretation. Uh, and she's right, but they couldn't explain it that way. Um, it, it, and then they did the whole thing of um, whenever you have humans involved, you will have mistakes. And by the way, that's an excuse I've never, ever used on a correction for one of my stories, because if I ever use that mistake, I, you know, um, people would laugh in my face. It's well, not exactly, a, you know, because no one considers you to be human that you cover. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it's not, especially when we're dealing with matters of, of health and, and, and public policy, it's it's not good enough to say we're, we're all human. Well, and the worst part of it is that it just sort of, you know, it lends, uh, uh, it buttresses people who want to put conspiracy theories out there or people who think that they're great data geniuses or, you know, they're going to try to figure this all out. And meanwhile, apparently the, the, the ready system, the whole state ready system has its own problems in terms of getting accurate data data from uh, from the testing sites, and it appears that a great many, and they don't know how many or which ones counties, have actually been undercounting uh, the number of cases. So that could be uh, 
uh, an issue. Delaney, but I take it none of this is going to affect uh, uh, back, to, we got back to school next week and it's all, you know, it's still gonna be all distance learning. I keep, uh, I'm a little confused. I keep reading about these waivers that you can apply for a waiver if you're a kindergarten or an elementary. Has anybody done that? Uh, yeah, that's been addressed in our district. Um, and it, it, it's just, it's not really possible in our district. A lot of parents have asked for that. Um, the last board meeting, which was probably like three weeks ago now, that was asked again. Um, and they, they just kind of said, they didn't really give a deep explanation of why, but they said that based on the, the way that our um, district is set up as far as like the physical buildings and stuff, it's just not, it's not gonna work and we, we wouldn't make that, um, we just wouldn't make that cut, so. Yeah. And, and I know youth sports have been canceled too, Josh. Um, although there's at least one Catholic high school that is resuming, that is resuming in-person workouts. Oh, just workouts. But to go to your other point, Jerry, is that that nobody knows who to trust anymore. If you're um, a person who's like, I believe the science, like, and those people, by the way, um, I you know, I believe the science too, but. The science um, is, is, is what the scientists have told us has changed. So if you're one of those people who's like, I believe the science, you know, you're kind of in a weird spot because they've just told us that we actually, our numbers are much worse. And so we can't really rely on the data scientists um, the way we have, be patient, but we've got it right now. If you're a conspiracy theorist, you think, oh, well, of course they're bumping up. Ah, this proves because they, they want us to be closed even more to get Donald Trump out of office. So it's sort of bad when everybody now is confused and, and nobody knows who to trust. And so it would be great to sort of say, okay, now we're gonna get it right. Then we found out a couple of days after the deaths that the cases were actually underestimated. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very confusing time. And it's a reminder for us journalists to be super skeptical of everybody um, all the time. Um, in government, because um, that's our job. We have to shine a light on these things and make sure that we're holding them accountable because that's why we do it. I mean, they, they caught it themselves, but what if they didn't catch it? Yeah. We wouldn't know. Yeah, and I just think everybody else, the conspiracy theorists, the armchair epidemiologists, all of the uh, investment bankers with too, mind, too much time on their hands, should just, and excuse me, Mayor Lodge, shut the fuck up. So, all right, let's, uh, let's talk about schools some more. So the uh, Democratic uh, County Committee met last night uh, for their endorsements of the school board, Santa Barbara School Board. And Josh, I have to say, you've been extremely critical of uh, Gail <laughs> Teton Landis for uh, having, uh, having the endorsements too soon. And I, I've uh, consistently defended her. So uh, having them the day before the close of filing ain't, ain't too bad. But anyway, they endorsed uh, Laura Capps and uh, Wendy Sims Moten and Jackie Reed, all of the uh, so-called incumbents, which wasn't uh, a big surprise. But then, uh, Delaney, you interviewed uh, Virginia Alvarez, who is a new candidate. What, what, who is she, and what uh, is she? A, is she going to have a serious candidacy? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, she doesn't have any name recognition yet, uh, but she is at least in my opinion so far, and I haven't talked to all the candidates. In fact, I just looked this morning and there was another name who I- Oh, I is there a new name now? Yes, I can't, I can't even remember the name off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, there's another candidate now. So they're, they're still coming in, um, but she is, she's worked in the Montecito uh, Union School District for the last 20 years um, as both, she's in the, she works in HR, um, which no one on the board has that, um, that type of experience, but she's also been overseeing um, all of the, all of the fiscal activities. She knows her way around like a, a school budget, um, and she knows she knows how school districts work. And before before that time, even she um, worked in the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Actually, she was an assistant principal at San Marcos High School. Um, I, I can't quite recall. I know she was she worked um, as an academic counselor as well. Um, she went through the. Santa Barbara Unified School District. Her kids went through the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Um, and she actually has a really similar story to Hilda Maldonado, the new superintendent. She came over 
um, to Santa Barbara from Mexico at nine years old, and she didn't speak any English at all. Um, and, and back then there weren't any programs to help English learner kids, right? So she was just kind of in school, no, no idea. Um, and she learned things just through memorization. Um, so she has that immigrant story that really kind of connects her with equity the same kind of way Hilda does. Um, she's very supportive of the new meta plan that the district is implementing um, and getting multicultural, multilingual um, education into the district. Um, so she's kind of right on the forefront of those, those yeah. issues that already kind of perfectly fit. So I think she's going to be a really good candidate. Okay. So Josh, I guess our friend, uh, Wade Cowper is uh, helping uh, Virginia with with her campaign, and then um, you know the other person, uh, uh, and uh, it's it's just after eleven and filing closes at five today. But the other person we know uh, should uh, have an effect on the race is Brian Campbell, who we talked a little bit about last time, a conservative realtor. Um, I mean, it seems to me you got these three incumbents, you know, they're not really incumbents, but they, they're, they have the seats. So you really have to make the case against them. Uh, I, uh, you know, what, what's your thought on, I mean, the, the strengths that Virginia Alvarez brings almost sound like it's exactly kind of what the board's already doing. Do you think that Campbell will have a better shot at it just because he'll be the only one in that space and obviously be taking on, I think, a lot of the policies that uh, that the current board uh, has implemented. Well, Jerry, because I know Gail Teton Landis watches your show, I just want to say that when I think of great defenders of the Democratic Party, the Santa Barbara County Democratic Party, the first name that comes to mind is Jerry Roberts. <laughs> and I know she feels that way as well. So she'll be happy to know you're fully on board with her. I think that uh, Brian Campbell's got a great shot, and I think Laura Capps can thank Brian Campbell for getting the endorsement of the Santa Barbara County Democratic Party, because I think that uh, they're probably willing to let bygones be bygones after Laura challenged Doss because of the fear and concern they have about Brian Campbell getting elected. Brian Campbell did surprisingly well when he ran for city council. He, uh, I believe he came in second after Mike Jordan. He yeah, did. only like 500 votes behind Mike, who was the Democratic candidate, the Democratic endorsed candidate. Right, and Terry Jory was a player there. Many people thought she could have been one or two, and, and she ended up being three. So Mike, uh, Brian Campbell is very formidable in that, um, you know, and, and one of the things people don't understand about journalists is like when we frame it, it doesn't mean we feel this way. So I'm not endorsing Brian Campbell, but from a political perspective, he um, speaks to a very important um, disenfranchised um, audience in, in Santa Barbara, uh, a community of parents who are moderates to conservatives who believe that the school district has gone too far to the left. And Brian Campbell is one of those people who's gonna represent those families and he's gonna speak right to them and they're gonna vote for him. And if he's the only one of those types, um, he's going to win. I mean, it, it's sort of just based on the numbers. It, he's going to win. If he raises money, if he gets uh, somebody behind him that can organize, help him organize, and he can manage to get through the campaign without saying anything incredibly and highly offensive to people, he's going to have a great shot of winning. So I really think it's a case of Laura Capps uh, being a shoe-in for re-election. She's got so much name recognition, as we talked about, and she's just coming off a campaign. But also, uh, Brian Campbell's going to be right up there because fair education is going to throw everything they can behind them. And then you've got sort of Wendy and, and Jackie and, and, and Moni DeWitt and these other candidates who are coming forward. And it's, it's really a race where like that last seat, I think, you know, and I, we don't know. But I think that if you've got a whole bunch of Democrats running and Brian Campbell running, he's probably going to get one of those seats. And then we're talking uh, Jackie Reed, that third spot, you know, it's going to be really interesting to cover. Yeah, well, you know, I, I agree with that, your analysis that Campbell's going to have strength and that, you know, Caps is going to also have strength. I, I think Wendy Sims Moton Delaney is going to be strong. Uh, she's been very, I mean, she's the highest ranking uh, a black uh, elected official in the county, I think. And uh, she's been very visible in the Black Lives Matter uh, thing. She co chaired that big. Um, uh, community forum that the Board of Supervisors had. I think she's going to be strong. 
I think that of the incumbents, Jackie Reed is really the weak link there. And, uh, uh, you know, she's not, you know, she kind of speaks in this academic jargon all the time. And it's, it's kind of hard to translate. It sounds like it's translated from the Swedish half the time. And, um, you know, I, I think, I mean, how is Virginia going to differentiate herself from Jackie or any of the incumbents? I can answer that easily. Um, Virginia, and even just as someone who interviewed her, um, I yeah, was the yeah, first You have a very good Q&A up, which is, really uh, tells you a lot about her. And I'm going to have a Q&A for every single candidate at, at some point, so be ready for that. <laughs> um, but but she, she, you know, when I interviewed her, she, I, it was the first time she's ever been interviewed in a formal way ever in, in her life. As far did as you do it on Zoom or did you go... We met and we met on our lunch break so we could get the photo and stuff um, in, in Montecito. But um, she talks like a normal person. So you're just talking about that academic jargon right there. That's the opposite of her. She just kind of talks like a normal human, um, talk, talks about her story. She's not trying to appear political or trying to appear like she has all this um, experience, um, you know, running for a position. She doesn't. So she just kind of is herself and um, she's very much so like, these are the skills I have, use them if you want. Um, this is what I can bring to the table and that's it. And that's kind of what the other candidates that they, they don't have, they're more polished and they have more of the same um, kind of lines. But you know, I 100% I ag um, agree with um, Josh's assessment of, of Brian, um, Brian Campbell. And in fact, um, at the last night, um, you know, that was half of Laura's pitch was beware um to the, to the there, there's a group of conservatives that's going to be obviously talking about actually i think she did say fair education um fair education is is um, backing this candidate so you better back me because he's gonna he's gonna be backed <laughs> and and we don't want him um sitting up on the dais so uh it's definitely gonna he definitely is gonna be pulling some weight if laura spent you know almost half of her time talking about him rather than herself yesterday. <laughs> you know, Josh, I mean, if the election had been held a year ago, it would have been so much more interesting because, well, it would have been interesting in a different way is what I mean to say. I mean, we had the uh, the Mad Academy scandal. You had the whole uh, blow up over Ed Barron's. There was a lot of uh, talk about and debate about just communities at the time. And it was pretty clear that, you know, Matsuoko was, was uh, the, the Kerry Matsuoko, the, the now departed superintendent was presiding over a kind of a failed administration. And Jackie Reed and Wendy Sims Moton particularly, and, and Laura to a large extent, you know, just kind of went along. I mean, Laura was, questioned him more than the other two did. And then when Kate Ford came along, I think she really got her spine stiffened and, and they, they started to challenge him. But now, you know, the incumbents are going to say, oh, look, we brought this great new superintendent in and she's going to bring everybody together and so on. And it doesn't seem like they're going to be paying a price uh, for the discredited Matsuoko era. So uh, how do you, how do you, how do they, how do you get at a candidate over that, do you think? Well, I, I think there are still plenty of issues that her education is going to, to run on and they're going to continue to talk about the achievement gap. They're going to continue to talk about uh, social emotional learning and the district sort of uh, effort to thread that through everything that they do. And uh, they're still going to have these national touch points that are going on that they're going to hang their hat on. And uh, Brian Campbell is going to be right there with them. The, the challenge with Campbell is uh, he can beat himself. If he doesn't um, tone down his um, his style, he yeah, can, he bangs a little heavy on the keys. Yeah, and in the council, you know, he can he can be sort of um, he can come across. Some might say a little bit on the um, you know attitudeish man. Well, he's angry. He seems like an angry, angry guy. Yeah. Side, and um, if he starts telling people what they should think, that's you know not going to be good for him in a close race, but. Um, if somebody can get him in a room and say, hey, smile more and uh, be sweeping in how you talk and don't criticize anybody individually, he might be okay. I just don't know if he's made that way. Uh, Delaney, you, you agree with me, don't you, that Josh, 
gosh, could have had a, a much more lucrative career as a political consultant than uh, than as a journalist. Uh, so you had a, your cover story, Delaney, on uh, pods, uh, education related, as much as I hate to drop politics and talk about policy. But um, so pods, what are pods and uh, wh what's going on with them? Pods are, um, they're kind of the, they're just the height of, of what is going on right now with alternative schooling. Um, with so many counties, I, I think like, I don't even know how many counties are on the watch list at the moment. But 38. Really, 38 at the moment, okay. 38, 38 counties and all of the school districts within those counties have to start off the school year with distance only learning. And for many parents, they don't want that. That's not gonna work. Um, for a multitude of reasons, maybe just the spring was so traumatic, they don't even, they don't trust that it's going to be better this time around. Um, they work full time, they just, they can't make it work. Um, maybe their kid just really didn't learn anything and they're honestly just want their kid to, to better, better absorb the information and they don't have the means to do so themselves. Um, whatever the reason being, they are, their families are forming two, three, maybe seven kids tops um, in these little pods, sometimes called micro schools. Um, and they might hire a credentialed teacher, a tutor. Sometimes a parent just acts as the teacher and purchases curriculum online. Um, there's so many different variations. A lot of kids now are actually remaining enrolled in the, the local public school, but they're having a teacher at their house in these pods with other kids. Um, and it's so that these kids can, um, they can have socialization, um, they can have a, a real person there to help them understand because really six-year-olds don't understand through a computer screen. And um, it can, can allow the parent to go to work. I mean, right, exactly. Yeah. So there's so many reasons why this is happening. And so this is just kind of the height of what it looks like. Um, but there's, there's equity issues, obviously. Um, not everyone can join a pod. Um, it, you know, it can be thousands of dollars depending well, how on- much How much did uh, James uh, Fankner's uh, kid, how much? I, I was sort of dumbfounded by the uh, per per month uh, cost of that that you had in the story. What was it? Yeah, at? and he's actually cutting it down um, now because they couldn't they couldn't make it work the way they originally wanted to. So it's just going to be um, four girls actually, and it's going to be about a thousand dollars a girl a month, um, which is still really unaffordable for families who can barely make their own rent. I mean that is rent. So like, <laughs> you know, so it, it's. Um, the other thing that I was struck by, and it's Delaney's cover story, which is out all week, and for those of you who can still read in print, uh, unlike us, until there's a vaccine, guys. Um, it, 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 at the very end, you it was interesting, you were talking to some uh, childcare operators, and they said, hey, wait a minute, this is all illegal. This is just childcare, you can't do this, which was kind yeah. of and I, and I had talked, I had spoken with a few of them, um, and, and it's it's a really interesting environment that we're in right now because none of them wanted to be on the record because they're scared because this is their clientele that are doing these pods, and so they don't want to be speaking out against pods and um, losing their client base, but, you know, they they have to all get, they're, they're forced to get vaccines. Their children have to get vaccines. Every adult who lives in the house has to be fingerprinted. They can get random drop-ins where the state- uh, These are the childcare operators, but the right. pod people are not doing this. Right, but they're basically operating the same kind of situation as what these right. child operators have been doing for years, but without all of the oversight and regulation. Um, so if, you know, what hypothetically, God forbid, someone has a bottle of, prescription medication in their house that they leave out and they're not a licensed uh, child care facility and a child eats the pills or something you know it's just like that is why these laws are in place is for those types of situations yeah it's gonna, um, be and it's gonna catch up definitely because some of these pods are are being ran illegally but it's it's such a chaotic time right now i don't think that the state's really able to keep up with it and then josh you had a really good enterprise story this week and by the way, your room ranking is up, uh, is way up this week. I, I'm going to give you a six out of 10 on your room ranking. Uh, uh, you're not in the closet anymore and it's not all dark. So good, uh, good, good job on that. But uh, you had this story about one of the three uh, lucrative uh, retail uh, uh, cannabis uh, licenses in Santa Barbara has now been transferred to a new owner. What's that all about? So uh, there was a lot of controversy when the, the city was issuing these licenses. 
decided to only issue three. They were very uh, lucrative, very sought after. I think like 14 companies bid for the license. Uh, three got it. There was a scoring error. So that company was disqualified. And then the one that was four was moved up to number three. That third company, uh, Golden State Greens, was the third company in town to open a dispensary. Uh, it was uh, the pharmacy, coastal dispensary. They opened about a year after they got their permit. This third one hasn't opened. And one of the reasons is because this company, Golden State Greens, has sold a controlling interest of their company to this uh, Florida-based company called Jushi. And so it's a little bit of a uh, technical thing. You're not allowed, according to the city, to actually sell the license, but a company can sell their company to a, somebody else. Um, a and the license goes as an asset? Yeah, it's a transfer of stock. And so they sold it to this company that's uh, very that's very well known for going around the country and doing exactly this, which is buying uh, companies and what comes with that are the licenses. And, and, and then they're opening up these retail. This is the first retail dispensary this company, which is traded on the Canadian uh, Stock Exchange, has ever opened in California. So this is a national story. It's a big deal. And uh, they are coming in and they're saying that, hey, we're going to do this better than the local guys. We're going to do this better than Grand Farrar. We're going to do this better than Coastal. Um, these are local people who started these other dispensaries. and Which, uh, was, part of of, which was part of the point when we began all this. And once again, uh, you know, it just goes to the whole unintended consequences of this. And uh, thanks Supervisor Williams for making this the, uh, you know, the most important industry in, uh, in Santa Barbara County again. So, but some of the city council members are not happy about this transfer. Is that correct? Well, first of all, no one knew. Okay. And this was one of those things that was like the, the bigger narrative is that everybody on the council is going in, multiple directions. Nobody knows anything. Ariel Kalan is increasingly trying to control them, control what they say, who say they talk about, media. what they talk about to the media. And uh, they're all trying to like do damage control with Paul Casey. So they count and there's no leadership on the council. So the council's going in a million directions. They didn't know um, that this happened. It never went so to you them. told them. Done, yeah, it was done at, at the staff level um, they reviewed, it was a five page financial analysis. And uh, they basically said, oh, you guys, your company, you got a ton of money. You got a ton of cash. Sure, you can take this over. Um, the, think about this, Golden so State this Green. this never even well, went to the council. It wouldn't have come to their attention if you hadn't reported. Oh, they, they never came to the city council. This was done at the staff <laughs> level. And the thing is that this Golden State Greens, they sold a transfer of controlling interest of their company for millions of dollars so much that nobody's talking about it i talked to an insider who said somewhere probably this is worth about nine to eleven million dollars because it's one of three and so think about that company and what they gained by this and they weren't even in the top three in the first place they were four and they got put into three because of a scoring technicality and the other company got uh, thrown well, out. Kristen, so, Kristen, would, Kristen Snedden was the only one, I think, and you're quoted in your story. She's not happy about it. What was her specific complaint that it's supposed to be for local business, right? Yeah, well, she was unhappy that she wasn't informed, first of all, by the staff. And two, her understanding was that we were going to try to uh, um, have these businesses operated with a local preference and, you know, somebody who's going to be part of this community. And the other two were, this third company was originally from San Diego. So it was at least a California company, but um, now they're, they're out of it. And so this other company has big plans. They actually had the goal to say, we're going to serve the locals because the other two dispensaries serve the tourists and uh, they're going to be the best. They're going to do a little delivery as well. So there's a lot more to come, um, you know, on this issue. And um, it's the whole cannabis world. It's it's phenomenal because it seems at every turn there's first of all it's very lucrative, but at every turn there's also a lot of um, uh, things that go wrong or things that happen in a way that you really wouldn't expect. And so, uh, it's a great time to be a cannabis reporter. All right, all right. We got thirty seconds, Delaney. What do you got coming for next week? Oh man. Well, I'm doing a Q and A with every school board candidate. Um, and then I'm also gonna dig into the, I don't know if 
it's really on anyone's radar, the City College Board of Trustees race. Oh, yeah. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, what's her name? Victoria, Vic, uh, Veronica? Veronica it? Gallardo is finally being challenged after more than a decade of not being challenged, um, likely due to many of her comments that uh, were just blew up during um, BLM. And um, uh, Craig Nielsen's um, being challenged. But what's really fascinating is that Celeste Barber, the mother of council, Councilman Eric Friedman, is running. Um, well, she so we, was the Pledge of Allegiance lady. Yes, but yes, Pledge of Allegiance lady. Eric Friedman's mom is is running for Board of Trustees as well. So it's going to be a really interesting race because two of the okay. most. Um, yeah. We'll talk it's, about that next time. Uh, yeah. Josh, we got on a podcast this week. Um, I've got several podcasts lined up, but um, none none I'm ready to share at the moment. What are you doing this weekend, Jerry? Huh? What am I doing? I'm going to go cut weeds in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks. We'll see you next Friday. All right. Take care. Stay safe.